Reinventing the wireless network architecture towards 6G is a topic of this video. And in particularly, I will talk about something called cell-free mass MIMO and a new invention called radio stripes. And I'm Emil Bjornsson. I'm an associate professor at Linköping University. And this is a collaboration with industry, particularly Ericsson. So this is all going to be about wireless communication and particularly when it comes to mobile phones. And when you're mobile, is asking for videos or pictures or text from the internet, it connects to a base station. And this base station is getting this digital information being represented as a sequence of zeros and ones. And need to send this information to the mobile phone, but it can't do it just sending it over the air. You need to transform it into an analog electromagnetic signal. And then by receiving the signal that represents the information, the mobile phone is extracting information and get the video or the picture or whatever you are like to send. And how does this mapping work? Well, say that we have a sequence of bits, zeros and ones that we would like to communicate. Then we chop up this into some subparts, in this case, two zeros and ones at a time. And every time we send zero, zero, we represent it with a signal looking like this. Every time we are sending one zero, we are presented by this signal, one one by this signal, and zero one by a fourth signal like this. We have four different options here. And you can see that they all build on having a sine wave here. And then we have different shifts of that one in time. So next time we send one one, we send the same signal as the last time that we sent one one. Next time we send zero zero, same signal, and then it goes on like this. And even if I have dragged out the time axis like this here, actually each one of them here is sent for an incredibly short period of time. So you can have more than a million of these short segments per second. And it all depends on the bandwidth of the signals. So when you want to send a sequence like this, you represent it with a uh, time signal, electromagnetic signal. And this is how the signal looks like when we're sending it from a transmitter, but when we receive it, we receive something that is much weaker and where the main issue is that noise is added to the signal. So it would rather look like this. And from this noisy signal, the receiver in the mobile phone needs to figure out what was the signal that was sent from the beginning. And that means that the stronger the signal is, the easier it will be. And if you have a strong signal, you can also have more opportunities, uh, more options than those four that I was illustrating before. We can represent more bits in each segment. For example, your mobile phone is able to, instead of four, having 16, 64, in some cases, even more options to choose between. But it's only meaningful to do that if it can actually tell them apart, which only happens when the signal is strong enough compared to noise. So the main point here is a stronger signal leads to more information that can be transmitted. So why don't we have a strong signal all the time? Well, it also goes down to the basics of signals that are sent out. They are namely losing their signal strength quickly with the distance. So thanks exemplify that. Say that we have a sender here, this is illustrating an antenna. And this antenna is sending out the signal omnidirectional, in all directions equally strong. And in one of these directions, your mobile phone is located. And the fraction now of the sent out power that is going to be received here is how large is the receive antenna in your phone compared to the entire area of the sphere that is of the size of uh, the distance here. So you can view it as that you're blowing up a balloon of a certain size. And this mobile phone is a distance r away, so the sphere have a radius of r. So if you take the antenna area in your phone and then you divide it with the area outside the sphere of radius r, which is 4 times pi times r square, then this ratio is determining the received power fraction. And this fraction is usually very, very small. So for typical frequencies, you get at one meter, 0.001% of the power. That's what you receive. And at 10 meters, you get 0.00001%. So it's 
uh, two more zeros. And it continues to go on like that as you move the receiver further and further away. And typically you are further away than that in cellular communications. And this is still assuming that you're actually seeing the transmitter. If the signal also needs to propagate through a wall or bounce on different objects, you will lose even more. So you should be lucky if you receive one out of one million part of the transmitted signal power. Usually it's below one billion part. So how can we make sure that we get the stronger signal? Well, one option is to make the antenna area larger. So we can make the phone larger, but that's not really the trend that we are seeing. People are not walking around with a tablet instead of a mobile phone. Rather, the phones are shrinking in size and you can even use a smartwatch as a phone today. So this is not the right way to do things. Instead, we would like to direct the signal towards where the user are. And this is not a new concept. This is actually how cellular technology has been built for a long time. So the space station here, what it actually contains is big antennas with high directivity. They are tall because the signal are directive in the vertical domain. Uh, so it's only some tenth of degrees where most of the signal energy is located. And then there is one, two, and actually a third one on the back side. So it looks from above like this. These are three directive antennas. Each of them is supposed to cover 120 degrees horizontally and send the signal down to the ground where the users are. And the signals are even more directive uh, horizontally towards the middle of these 120 degrees. And since you cannot reach every user in the entire world from one base station tower like this, well, you put up many of them. And each user is measuring the signal strength to different ones and connect to the closest one. And that creates this type of area. Here are the users that are connecting this base station tower. Here are the users connecting this tower and so on. And each of these areas is called a cell. And that's why the technology is called cellular technology. So this is how the main technology is working. And we're using this type of directive antennas. And as an example, when you're using a typical directive antenna, you might have a 40 times stronger signal right in front of it than you would get with a antenna that's spreading out the energy equally much in all directions. That's also called 16 dBi. And the lucky users that are standing in front of the base station, they get this type of 40 times stronger signals. So they are lucky. But not every user will benefit from that. These users would have been within the right directivity, but there is an object that's blocking. So the signal instead needs to bounce on another object that is in another direction, and therefore they don't benefit from the directivity at all. In fact, they can even lose from it. Because the signal power is, is not created when you direct it, you take it from some directions and you focus in other directions. So you take it away from a direction like this to focus it here. And what we have been doing recently is to go from this type of classical antennas that still dominates in 4G to a new thing in 5G called Massive MIMO, where MIMO stands for multiple input, multiple output. And in Massive MIMO, we take these big antennas and we split it up into small antennas, 8 or 16 in the same size, uh, and then we put multiple of them horizontally as well. And that takes the directivity and shrinks it also horizontally. So we have narrow beams or vertically and horizontally. And since we now have beams that are much narrower than the 120 degrees that the antenna is supposed to cover, we need to be able to move it around where the user is. And that is the main thing of Massive MIMO. Strong and adaptive directivity. And when we direct the signal towards a user located in this direction, you can also send to another user located in other direction, as long as they are in different directions. So these are the good things. Different signals to different users at the same time and frequency, and they're all strong and adapted to where the user is. So does this mean that Massive MIMO solves all of the problems in wireless? Well, I would be happy to say that because Massive MIMO is something that Linship University is famous for. We have written the two main textbooks on this topic, but it doesn't solve all the problems. So you can handle more users, give them stronger signals, but a lot of problems remains. And I would like to illustrate that here. Here you can see at different positions what data rate you get. At some places you have a strong signal 
and therefore you get the good data rate and at many locations you get the bad signal and therefore you have a low data rate. And in particularly I put out one base station tower in all of these points where you have a strong signal and use that are close get the good data rate. But as they move around uh, to other places you are moving in way you get weaker signal and lower data rates. And uses that are equally close or rather equally far away from multiple base stations, they are at the edges of cells and they get the bad performance. And with massive MIMO, we can improve the performance for everyone. Users in the cell center benefit from the more directive signals, but also users at the edges get better performance. But we still have these large variations that we cannot do much about. What is the reason for that? Well, that is because the wireless network architecture of the past have been based on having base stations in tall towers or on rooftops, which means that they are naturally far away from where the users are. So far from users means that there are large signal strength variations that creates this also large variations in the data rates that the user can get. It also means that the technology becomes sensitive towards blockage. So if you have a big object that's between you and the base station tower, it will uh, block a lot of the signal power. And that might be the only base station that can cover you at that particular location. You will have a visible installation because they need to be big, these antennas, to be so directive so that they can reach you. And since they are far away, they also need to transmit with high power, even if they're directive, that requires active cooling, which also makes them even larger. So this is the problem. And today then we have these base station towers with a lot of antennas, which I call centralized MIMO. But the alternative would be to take these antennas and spread them out over the environment instead. Illustrated here by having antennas at many different locations, some lampposts or other places, and then you connect all of them by cables to some kind of central processing unit that is taking care of some of the processing. So when you are at a certain location, you will be surrounded by antennas now. All of those antennas will transmit to you in such a way that they are reinforcing each other's signals and not disturbing and that re requiring this type of processing. This is called distributed MIMO or more recently cell-free massive MIMO. And the idea of this is something that has been around for a decade or more. And I wrote a book in 2013 about this type of technology as well, how you should do this in theory in an optimal way. But that doesn't mean that you can do it in practice in a good way. Because what is the problem here? Well, you have a lot of meters of cables. You see all these dashed lines here is illustrating the cables that you need to put out. There's a lot of them. Our friends at Ericsson is calling this a spaghetti monster. And you will probably need even more antennas. It's not enough to take the antennas from the centralized MIMO and spread the same number of them out. Because there were good reasons to put base stations up in towers. You can see above different obstacles. You can send signals over the roof of a building to reach the next building. While that will not be possible when you are distributed. You put them down at street level, close to the users are. Then you will need to put out more antennas. Other complications are when it comes to complexity. How do you control the thing here in a good way in terms of the time that it takes to do the processing and for all the signals to gather at particular locations? And how can you take care of all the computation that are needed at one central place? It will be due to complexity. Well, this is where our new invention called radio stripes comes in. The idea here is that if you would like to put out an antenna at a particular location and draw a cable to that location, why just have a passive cable going there? Why not put a lot of antennas within the cable and turn the entire cable into a part of your network architecture? This is what the radio stripe is based on. So you have a long stripe containing a cable containing antennas and each antenna here is illustrated for, for example, the 3.5 gigahertz band, which is a typical band for 5G. And they are connected to an antenna processing unit that is containing all of the hardware component that you are needing. So filters, analog to digital converters, and uh, digital to analog converters, and all these other type of things that is in a typical antenna branch. And then you can question, how can you put all these things into a cable when the base stations are so large? Well, 
we can already do it in a mobile phone. So the idea here is that we should build this on the technology that we have been designing for mobile phone for a long time to, to create very, very small chipsets and do that instead of using this high power advanced equipment that we have been using in the base stations in the past. And if we are going up in frequency from 3.5 gigahertz to maybe 10 gigahertz, then within this antenna processing unit, which is not larger than what you will have in a cable, then you can fit also one dual polarized antenna. And if you go up to 28 gigahertz, you can have four dual polarized antennas and continues as you go up in frequency. You can fit everything into a cable and don't have any antennas that sticks out of it. And actually, here I have been having a uh, print L electronic uh, concept for radio stripes all the time. So you see the cable, we see the antennas here, and we see the black processing units. Although central processing units are required also when using radio stripes, most of the baseband processing can be done in each of the black antenna processing units. You can put it on the wall, you can hide it behind the wallpaper, you won't lose much of the signal energy from that. You can put that in whatever way you like. And if you uh, need a long one, well then just buy a long one. If you need many of them, then you put up many of them. It becomes very scalable and cost effective because you can just select how much you need. So we create as long stripes as we need. And this is an invention that was made to, in collaboration with the Linship University in Ericsson. One of the reasons that Ericsson showed interest in these type of technologies in the, from the beginning is that there are places today where the, the base station technology cannot even be put up. For example, cultural places uh, where you're not allowed to put up disturbing big base stations. But you can see here, you're actually allowed to put up uh, cables. So why not put radio stripes on those cables? And then you can provide great coverage to everyone at this location, which is St. Uh, Fontaine de Trevi in Rome. Or in a factory. It's usually very hard to provide good wireless coverage to the factory, which is why we're using cables instead. And that is because we have lots of disturbances, lots of large machines. So if you put out base station at some discrete locations, they will get blocked. But if you can put up radio stripes everywhere, you will be sure that you can see at least some parts of them and therefore get good coverage from those parts. Stadium with a lot of people, if you put up a few base stations, it will be hard for them to cover everything and provide all of the capacity that you need. But with the radio stripes put out, all the users will be close to some of them and can get good service from those ones. Or in the mall, there is a lot of construction elements already where you can hide this type of radio stripes and provide the coverage that you need when people are shopping. And when I was describing directive antennas before, it was like you have a signal coming from one place, with strong directivity, horizontally and vertically, but that is not how it's gonna look like when you are instead surrounded by antennas. Here's an example of that, with a small room, antennas along the walls, and we are sending signals from all of them such that they are adding up constructively at one location. So here we are showing the normal channel gain or signal strength at lo this particular location. And we see that they are much smaller at all other locations. And the place where you get the strong signal is essentially a ball of the wavelength divided by say four in radius. That's where you have a strong signal and that fits a mobile phone. But uh, that also means that the signal not strong at other places, so another user can be very close, have their mobile phone, have their ball around it where you have a strong signal. And this concept was shown uh, just at a conceptual level at the Mobile World Congress 2019 and got a lot of good coverage, both in uh, English media and also in Italian media because our industrial PhD student that have been co-inventing this technology is from Italy. And when they were an inauguration of Ericsson headquarters in Milan, then they were actually using the radio stripe as the inaugural ribbon. And it is actually the only use case of radio stripe that has appeared so far because it's still at the conceptual level. But this is something that we really would like to deliver in the future.
for 6G, for example. And here is Giuseppe Conte, the Prime Minister of Italy, that got one of his Ericsson radio stripe when he was visiting a Ericsson office as well. So what is then the main goal of this technology? Well, it is to get good and reliable wireless connectivity everywhere. So if this is the performance that you can get with the 5G network, different positions, you have much better data rate than in the past, but there's still these large fluctuations. Then with radio stripes, uh, the idea is that you will get much higher performance everywhere. But in particularly, you will never drop down to bad performance. You will still have some natural variations because sometimes it will be close to antenna and sometimes it will be slightly further away. But if you're never far away, you will never get bad signal strength. This is, of course, a complement of the cellular network technology today. We don't intend that people will put up this radio stripe just everywhere. But we will focus on places where you are not allowed to put up base stations today, where you cannot get close enough to the uses with base station towers indoor locations or particularly when you go up to higher frequency bands where the signals can get blocked by your hand well if the hand blocks the signal from this direction well then the signal can come in from another direction and by being surrounded by antennas you get what you call macro diversity the risk that you are blocking all of the signals will be much much smaller than just blocking one signal coming from one particular location so there are many benefits of this new technology, both when it comes to installation and functionality. So there's this reliability thing that I talked about. You cannot uh, so likely block all the signals coming from all directions. So when you have many antennas spread out. Few components, you, we build this on uh, the simple components that we have in mobile phones today with the economy of scale instead of this complicated uh, power hungry hardware that we are using in the base stations. And we have the flexibility in terms of how we use it. We can put it up in many different ways. There were some examples here, but you can probably figure out many more examples yourself of how you would actually deploy something like this. It's designed to be scalable. If you need more uh, capacity, you put up another radio stripe or you select how long you want it to be, depending on how your room looks like. And this will really reduce the cost. You can have many, many meters of radio stripe for the same cost as one big base station of today. Easy to install compared to a base station of today where you have an engineer need to install. It's a very heavy equipment, needs to be properly directed. Uh, now, hopefully anyone can put them up just as anyone could put up a wallpaper if they just read up on how to do it properly. And we can also make it invisible. It becomes so small that we can hide it between objects or just simply make it invisible. It was located here from the beginning of the video, but you couldn't see it. And if you would like to know more about this, we have an overview paper in the EURSIP Journal on Wireless Communication and Networking. It was called Ubiquitous Cell-Free Massive MIMO Communication, and it's available as open access. And this is a collaboration between Linköping University and Ericsson.